Welcome back, everybody, to another Partly Pace podcast. Uh, I'm Russ, one of your hosts, and I'm joined today by Nolan from the Bike Sauce. How's it going? Good. How are you? Good. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, what are the most important components um, on the bike, as well as some um, kind of commenting on on new drops. Um, before we get into that, uh, how's how's life been <laughs> on the YouTubes? Uh, it's been fine for for us over here. Um, yeah. I don't know. Last couple of weeks have been kind of hectic. Family getting getting sick and stuff. I missed a week. I missed a I missed an upload after yeah. we were just talking about how being consistent is so important. It's, it's over. It's over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the streak is over. I missed a week. <laughs> um, I'm in the same situation. So, um, but you've got a good excuse. <laughs> yeah, we just got rid of everything in the last like ten days or so. We've been driving slowly from as. as <clears throat> slowly from Missoula here to LA. And if uh, the, the set here and the audio sounds a little bit different, it's because I'm in my uh, childhood bedroom in my 40s. So you too can be a <laughs> professional YouTuber. <laughs> uh, so yeah. how's it been? I mean, you guys have been nomadic for the better part of two weeks now or a week and a half. Yeah, it's been, it's funny. It, it's always like strange at first. And then, you know, the, the human human psyche and, and body is just so quick to adapt. So now it just kind of feels like the norm. Yeah. Um, although it's always like a struggle to keep organized when, when we've got all this stuff. Sure. Um, but we, have you ever been out to the Alabama Hills? I haven't. No, actually. You should go. <laughs> yeah. I know. I keep hearing about it. <laughs> it's kind of, it's, um, so if I were to do, if we were to do it again, you could camp, there uh some of the camping is like seasonal so it might be shut but there's a really cute town of lone pine that has some good lodging and from there you can ride into the alabama hills mm -hmm. and it seems like a less discovered joshua tree to me <laughs> uh, I, I mean of... i've seen a lot of clips from that area mm -hmm. <clears throat> but i haven't yeah i haven't been that way yet but i'll put it on the list yeah yeah it only, it only <laughs> took us a you know, moving to Spain to finally make it out there. <laughs> <laughs> so how's it been? So you went to Portland for a little bit. How was that? Did you have a hang there with like fans? And uh, we, we were at, we were in Bend um, oh. and had a hangout over at a new bike shop called Chariot Bikes. Right. And it was, it was pretty good. Yeah, I think there was about 20, 20 to 30 people that showed up uh, oh. for kind of a, a last minute kind of thing. So that was cool. And then... From there, we went down to Mount Shasta, uh, stayed in town there, and did a ride up Old Old McLeod Road. And it's pretty much just like it was like pretty much straight up from where we were staying. <laughs> nice. I think you posted something about that recently, right? That it's pretty picturesque <laughs> from what I saw. <laughs> yeah, that whole like uh, Eastern Sierra region. Uh -huh. um, right. When we lived in California, we didn't really have a, a vehicle, so never had a chance to explore. But yeah, that whole area down through Owens Valley and Alabama Hills, highly recommend. <laughs> we'll check it out. You didn't uh, stop by, I guess you would have passed Mammoth area then. Uh, yeah, I forget why we didn't go through Mammoth, but mm. we, we skipped it. Um, I think there was a decision point somewhere around um, uh, the Alabama Hills. I see. But yeah, we drove over... Or Laura drove over Sonora Pass, which mm. is bananas. Because <laughs> it's, you know, it's this super windy road, gets really narrow, 25%, and there's just like a drop off right there. Oh. <laughs> Your favorite kind of driving? <laughs> yeah. I would have, I would have like frozen in fear. Um, <laughs> it would have been a much better bike ride than, um, right. than the drive. Yeah, yeah. All those things you were saying that, yeah, those make for a great ride. Yeah. So how long are you guys in? I mean, it occurred to me we if we planned and had the foresight, we could have done this in person. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> now, we, we just got in yesterday. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And how long are you sticking around? Is this uh, your last stop? Or you, you said you're going to Arizona for a bit, too? We're going to we're actually going to go down to El, to Long Beach um on sunday and hopefully do a meetup over at uh, the bicycle stand it's this really cool shop that sells bikes on consignment so they always have some pretty cool vintage stuff cool 
And from there, we're going to go to the Palm Desert, uh, go through Julian, get some pie, uh, come back through here, then go up to Santa Barbara, San Luis Obispo, uh, Walnut Creek, and then beeline it back. <laughs> <laughs> Dang. Um, yes. Yeah, sounds epic. Yeah, so we're, try we're trying to do all the things, uh, you know, all our favorite spots in California before we, we sure. leave. Head up um, in and out a couple times. I suppose yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is um, um, this one like insane road that we were looking at when we were riding around the Alabama Hills and it's Horseshoe Meadow Pass. Have you heard of it? I, yeah. All these, these, this all sounds familiar. I've never been though. If you look it up, it's bananas. It's basically like, um, you know, an equivalent of a, a tour level climb. Oh yeah. It's only four switchbacks. Okay, but it climbs for 19 miles, and I think it gains like 6,000 feet. It looks amazing. <laughs> Holy crap! Yeah, the whole time we were looking at it, I was like, oh, I wonder if people ride that. So when we got back to our hotel, you know, sure enough, um, I think Safa Brian Brain did a descent video down there. Mm. Um, Blackheart actually did a, a video going up uh, Horseshoe mm. Meadows. Okay, so. Uh, if we were gonna loop back around there, we'd probably. We did, I think we could make it. It'd be a slow slog, but we we could get up there. <laughs> Six thousand feet. Like I'll I'll admit that sounds um, that that scares me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, like there's, everyone's got their numbers, right? Like for what they would consider like a hard ride, and well, so yeah, six thousand is <laughs> a lot for for me. <laughs> it's a lot for me. I mean, I'm not gonna break any speed records, but I think uh, given enough enough food you can probably get up there <laughs> very cool so yeah it's the last kind of road trip before you guys are um going across the the pond i suppose um yeah. i just like recently i don't know what it is I've, I've been coming to the realization of of like just how like i don't know influential your channel is <laughs> and so every time i see something like i, I listen to the marginal gains podcast and you're on there, like there you were on the <laughs> Marginal Gains podcast. Uh, I opened up my email. Uh, who, what was it? Was um, or not Matt Kwan? Oh yeah, yeah. I got a newsletter from uh, or not, and there's your face on the on the page, <laughs> front page of their website. Like, I get, I get. Um, every time we do a live stream, I'm, I'm just surprised that. Uh, I guess I'm not surprised. Surprised is, is impressive how how influential in, uh, influential your channel has been, um, and I'm I feel luckier and luckier to like, be here a part of it, <laughs> talking about nonsense. So, um, yeah, I think you're a great foil. You bring the science, and I bring like the English major. <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah, um, but but yeah, also the, not taking it too seriously. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the marginal gains podcast was pretty fun. Um, yeah. I feel like. I was probably a really unlikely guest mm -hmm. for, you know, what and who they usually interview, but it was a good time. Uh, I think Michael Houghton, the the co-host is right. Uh, he pops in our discord on occasion. Oh, okay. And um, like we had Josh before he blew up on YouTube. <laughs> I remember. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> one. You'll, you'll see him on GCN and, um, you know, Dylan Johnson's channel or something, but we, we had Josh first. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I remember that that uh, live stream you did a super like I, that was one that I watched like end to end, just like super fascinated with the, all the science and stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Uh, cool. So we've got 100 people in the channel. We should uh, hop into uh, the topics of the day. Um, so what are we talking about again? <laughs> most most important bike components. Right. I'm um, so surprised that we we managed to pull today off, um, just with your travel <laughs> schedule and kind of last minute stuff. But I mean, what I note, what I recall is that you were uh, testing out some of the logos wheels. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. Um, so I didn't I didn't know you had a set. Um, I've got a set here going on the black heart, and so I, you know I just got to thinking. You know, these are pretty interesting wheels in my opinion. So I thought maybe it'd be a decent discussion on like. Well, not to spill the beans, but <laughs> one of the most <laughs> impactful upgrades you can make on a bike. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, so how how should we do this? Should we go with, like front to back of the bike and just you know very quickly talk about 
you know how how important that thing is <laughs> yeah sure yeah yeah what's your take on it um you know in terms of you know handlebars and controls hard to say right it's a lot of its uh, personal preference um i think we in one of our over and underrated segments talked about um you know drivetrains or shifting and um you said like while it's you know nice to have like it has kind of like less of an overall effect on the riding experience mm -hmm. right um so i i totally agree with that i think that's that tends to be overweighted like people will see Durace on the bike and get excited uh but you know it's, it's i feel like it makes less of an effect on your the actual feel of how a bike rides right right um how about the frame where would you rank that in terms of importance of uh things on the bike <laughs> frame well shoot i mean i suppose if you put it that way frame, <laughs> frame is probably number one <laughs> probably yeah i mean that's what that's a, the one thing that you can't change right it's baked yeah. in you, you 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 bought it and, and it's yours and there's no right. uh, fiddling with it right yeah so i think when we talk about most impactful upgrade on a bike we're assuming the frame is fixed <laughs> right okay right. frame is fixed yeah frame is fixed so from there what do you where do you, where do you spend your money yeah so. um what's <laughs> this is gonna what do you think of fancy headsets <laughs> is that <laughs> is that where you should prioritize your money <laughs> this question feels kind of biased <laughs> uh i mean there's fancy ones that look nice yeah um, but but much like uh you know, pivots on a on a full suspension mountain bike. Your headset's only turning plus or minus fifteen degrees if you're riding. <laughs> if you're doing it right, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I wouldn't put too much money into to heads. even if you're doing like bar spins. You, I mean, you don't need ceramic bearings to to optimize that. Um, yeah, uh, one <laughs> of the the people we interviewed at made uh, alder who goes by road holes on instagram was like you know headsets way overrated i i ride them until they're, they're like super notchy and indexed <laughs> <laughs> and i have to i have to agree i mean i appreciate you know chris king but you know on my personal bikes i'll just go with like a cane creek and call it call it a day you know good enough for me <laughs> yeah I've, i'm i'm gravitating towards wolf tooth these days because mm -hmm. I like well, I just I like the styling, but I also like that it kind of finds that middle ground. It's it's high quality, but it's not like ridiculously expensive. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, what else is there to bike? I guess I mean saddle. You know, again, that's pretty personal, right? You either love it or hate that. You should find one that works for you. Yeah, I mean, I have to agree with. Um, I've got the comments open here. I was going to say all the touch points, right? Yeah, so you're you're. The, the cockpit setup, the the saddle and the pedals. And, you know, what someone's inevitably going to bring up is it's not necessarily components too. Probably one of the most important things you could do is, is get a fit, right? Right. Probably the number one upgrade. And I'm so lame for saying that because I've admittedly, I've never had a professional fit. So what? <laughs> I know. I know. You, should, you know what? I should hook you up with the my velo fit guys and you can you can try their their fit from home thing yeah i was gonna it. i was gonna suggest that for for one of the episodes you know how effective is that compared yeah. to like a professional fit um so maybe we can talk about that another time but yeah that's definitely something especially because i did a long ride a couple weeks ago um it was called the good dirt ride in mm -hmm. um, rancho santa margarita it's a mountain bike ride it was only 50 miles but it was it was 5,000 feet, which for me is like <laughs> twice my number, you know? Right. <laughs> um, and I was hurting, like hurting in places I wasn't, I wasn't imagining, you know, my legs were fine, you know, saddle area was fine. Um, it was like my shoulders and my neck, you know, I felt mm. like my neck muscles couldn't support the weight of my head anymore. Ouch. Um, and I know that it doesn't have to be that way. I think a fit could probably solve a lot, a lot of that. Yeah. yeah yeah i'll put fit in the top three <laughs> of most impactful upgrades yeah uh yeah i totally agree fit um you know i 
get asked a ton like which bike should i buy and i usually try to get point people towards a bike fit first uh before they commit to to a bike yeah um just because it really doesn't matter like what bike you end up with if if it fits like ass it's just gonna be no fun <laughs> right right yeah for sure it's one of those things for me it's like you know do as I say, not as I do kind of thing. <laughs> like it's been on my list of things to do for like years now. I just haven't, uh, haven't, haven't done it, but I'll probably do it now yeah. that we talk, now that I'm accountable. <laughs> there you go. Um, let's see. So that leaves, I think, uh, the round spinny things on the yeah. bike. <laughs> I already saw that someone put tires, which I think it's true. That's definitely up there. Uh, and no doubt someone's going to write, you know, it's the only thing that touches the ground on the bike is the yeah. tires. Right. Right. So, yeah. Um, tires are I, huge, obviously. Um, there's so like, the thing is like, I feel like unless you ride a ton of tires, it's harder to appreciate because I mean, you'll get used to anything, you know, right. you'll get used to the stock tires on your bike, but, but once you throw on like a nice compliant, you know, supple in your words tire <laughs> yeah it makes it it actually makes a huge difference yeah did, did you have a aha tire that was like oh i didn't know it could feel like this <laughs> yeah and i was surprised by which tire it was because um um it was a terravail tire that mm. kind of was like wow i, I kind of see what a, a supple tire can can do or or be for the for the feel of the ride um which one is it the washburn or something it was a 650B gravel mm. sparwood. Yeah, the sparwood Spar tire. But okay. but I got in the light and supple. Um, and actually, surprisingly, I liked it so much, I ended up putting tear veils on the hardtail as well as the, the full suspension. So I, I actually, that's a brand that I feel like for for the for the money, you're getting like a pretty, pretty good feeling tire. Um, but I mean, there's so many tires out there right now. So it's kind of like you got to, <laughs> try a bunch and just see what see what works for you yeah yeah um yeah i definitely think uh what was like a tire you know like the reneers i forget what it's called is it the rat the rtps rat trap pass or it was their their first like 650b slick one mm -hmm. that was a aha moment um but uh but i agree they're they're definitely like less expensive options that get you most of the way there yeah, yeah so like the Terravel stuff i'm a big fan of the the soma tires right i think they're they're made in by pan racer so the same factory that that pushes out the the renaeurs tires mm -hmm. uh, so the casadero i think is um probably my all-time favorite i have it on my personal bike and we put some on laura's bike and that's what we're taking to, to spain we like it that much yeah so. yeah that's been one of your top picks for a long time i think right yeah i mean there's you know like everyone's come out with a gravel tire right so mm -hmm. um like pirelli um you know there's the pan racer stuff and yeah there's just yeah good you're tried... doing bike tires now are they really <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah and they're kind of cool they're, they're they have a couple of gravel models goodyear yeah as in goodyear you know like car tires so yeah um michelin too Right. They're like, wow, there's some money in bike tires. So <laughs> <laughs> they're just slumming it in the bike industry. <laughs> right. Have you have you had a chance to try out the American classic yep. tires? Yeah, I have a set of the Udin. I don't I don't know how you pronounce it. Udin. Udin. <laughs> yeah. Um on one of the bikes over here. I was surprised by them. They're I mean, for, for how much they cost. Um I don't I can't really fault them for much. They're they're a tad heavy, I think. Yeah, but not even by that much. Yeah, um, setup yeah, well, was pretty easy. You know, I think they were a better value when they first came out because hmm. I think when they first launched, they were in the thirty to forty dollar range, and now right. it's like crept up, and it's about the same price as some Terravel tires. Yeah. Um. But yeah, that perfect, perfectly fine brand. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So yeah, tires for sure. Fit tires, and then the big hint in the thumbnail <laughs> is the wheels. <laughs> yeah. yeah, quit beating around the bush, huh? <laughs> right. Um, I think we both agree, probably, that this 
for, you know, for dollar for dollar, a, a set of upgraded wheels, probably the best thing you can do for a stock bike. That's not like the top shelf, you know, flagship model. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, you know, when I test rode the Sklar, um, you know, I liked it enough that I bought it and I put, you know, some alloy wheels that I had lying around and it didn't feel the same as the, the test bike because oh. Adam had put on like these baller carbon wheels <laughs> that were really light. And I was like, dang, that's, that's the difference. <laughs> yeah. you know, riding them back to back. Right. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> and it's, it's crazy how, um, you know, even if you spend three or $4,000 on a bike, like a complete bike, you're still generally getting some pretty basic heavy wheels, right? It's not until you're getting like, you know, some crazy S works thing that comes with like the robot wheel stock. Yeah. Um, but I think to a large degree, the, the industry is expecting people to replace a few things, right. When they get the bike, like wheels and maybe, a, maybe a saddle stuff like that. Um, yeah, like yeah. anything that you would buy from QVP, uh, any all city bike or former or once <laughs> once while they're still here, or it's early bike. That's gonna be the weakest point of the bike, yeah. and all those bikes you can bring to life by upgrading the wheel set. Yeah. Uh, you know, carbon clearly is a nice option, but I don't think necessarily. Uh, but it is uh, it is uh, the the baller option if you can do it. Yeah. So yeah, I'm gonna, a, go ahead. I'm gonna link to these um, these pages I have on the screen here after the the live stream. But, okay. Yeah. Yeah. A while ago, I did a video about like you know, in the way I pictured it in my head, there's this like plot or like a graph of sort of like you know, there's some point of diminishing returns with wheels, and you can improve the bike so much without spending a ton. And then after a certain point, it starts to taper off as with most things. But, you know, the, the debate about carbon versus alloy wheels, I feel like there's a ton of good alloy options these days, more so than before. Um, right. And so like that line is like a little bit more blurred. Like you can get like a super high end set of alloy wheels now that cost just as much as like a, a mediocre carbon wheel set. Yeah. Yeah. So you um, sent this article to review. This is on cxmagazine.com. Mm -hmm. And this is a pretty good breakdown on, on wheels in, in general. Um, to, to be honest, there was a, a point in the channel when I was getting lots of offers to review wheels. I was like, no more. <laughs> <laughs> um, just because for for my style of riding, realistically, I'm never gonna push them to like the absolute knife's edge where I'd notice, you know, the the very minute performance differences. Mm -hmm. um, but this was a, a pretty good breakdown on you know thing things to look at when you're when you're purchasing a a wheel. Right. Yeah, it's not all you know. It's not all weight and inner rim width, and you know spoke counter you know those things like the those are like the, the the marketing points a light wheel feels nice um inner rim width is arguably a pretty like inner rim width is like the head tube angle of, of wheels you know? <laughs> <laughs> everyone cares about inner rim width right now um but i feel like you know diving down into it there's so much more and up until recently you know i kind of was just like uh, people are gonna blast me in the comments but i i, I was kind of of the belief that you know a hub is a hub it just holds the bearing and it holds the spokes right. what's the big deal but yeah there's there's more to it than that and i think lately as i'm looking um looking at different wheel brands looking at different wheel designs the design of the hub is actually awfully critical right it's right. literally the hub of the of the of the wheel um and so that goes with like a lot of technological choices that that designers have mm -hmm. um these uh, logos wheels that we're we're both testing uh they they use the dt swiss style star ratchet system which i mean there's there's a pretty strong case to be made that it's a more reliable more robust drive mm -hmm. system than the the paul you know the paul ratchet style yeah um yeah and there's there's a lot more to it you know straight pull versus um versus your j-bend spokes and then 
bearing type, all all these things kind of make a, a difference when you put them all together. Yeah. I have to say I'm a big fan of the DT Swiss hubs. Mm -hmm. um, I love that you can disassemble them without any, any tools. Like some other hubs are just like, you know, there's like this huge technical man manual <laughs> right. uh, and you need like a bearing press and like all this other crazy um, equipment to, to service them. Mm -hmm. But also uh, what's funny is, it, and then he mentions this in the article where uh, the weight of the cassette is enough to kind of pop off the free hub and expose like the, the, uh, the star ratchet. Uh -huh. um, that actually happened to me when I was installing it on the bike and I didn't know which order things, things went back together. So I had a total freak out. Uh -huh. um, but that also happened to me on another wheel set I was testing that used Pauls. And just like in the article, like the Pauls like flew out. I was like, oh crap. <laughs> I think I feel like that's like a rite of passage. Everyone's had that moment where like you hear the Pauls like hit the ground and you're trying to keep track of where they went. Um, yeah, yeah, every time that's actually happened, the, go ahead. Uh, every time that's happened, I thought like I broke it, but apparently that's just a part of some hub designs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the poles are meant to slide in and out of the little slot, but then you know a lot of the older hubs have poles and literally little springs that you have to align to make sure that they they spring back. Yeah, um, it's funny you mentioned that with the uh, with the logos wheels. I, I had the same thing happen to me. I was. <laughs> Like I wanted to get some photos, so I, you know, I was pulling the free hub body off, and when it's, you know, from the factory, it's pretty tight, so you got to pull kind of hard. And I pulled it off, and all the pieces went. <laughs> I was like, oh shit! Um, I I freaked out, man. Like I went on the the website looking for some technical manual. Uh, they didn't have one. They just had that exploded diagram, uh, right. and that's what I. That's what I use. Actually, let me see if I can find it. But but that's all you need because it's all on the same axle, right? So you just yeah. gotta get the order right and, and you're okay. Yeah, I basically just stared at this picture <laughs> for 20 minutes. It's like, okay, the springs are in the right orientation. Um, yeah. So if if I can figure it out, people, you can figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, I, I mean, the reason I brought up this topic is because well, selfishly, I'm working on a video about, you know, what to look for when you're, when you're shopping for wheels. And yeah. So like things like the, the hub, hub design, hub ratchet design, whether it's Paul's or, or um, the star ratchet design, or that'll be a segment. And then the, you know, straight pull versus um, J Ben. And then the spoke type, you know, matters a lot for the feel of the ride. Mm -hmm. um, and then, nipple exposure it's a weird way to phrase that but you know like some of the some of the wheels for the you know the quarter of a watt that you may or may not save they'll like conceal the nipples inside the rim and it's impossible to service if you need to you know trim yeah. or replace a spoke um so you know what i like about the logos wheels is just everything was everything started from a design perspective and, and usability and serviceability and, and simplicity. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just, you know, a lot of the the design elements that went into these wheels just makes a lot of sense, which is yeah. uh, increasingly hard, hard to find sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like when, when a bike is specked out with like a off component, you're like, why they do that? It's just because they had a spare part. They didn't like follow through on, you know, kind of the design intent. Mm -hmm. but, but I agree this wheel, um, you know, putting it together, um, you know, and just seeing how it, how it's built and, um, it's, it's a pretty good wheel. <laughs> yeah. I do. I do appreciate the wider internal, uh, rim width, uh -huh. because for the 650 B by 450, 48 millimeter tires, I, I ride, I've noticed when it's like a 25 millimeter internal diameter, like it tends to make it look like a light bulb right. and just feel like really kind of uncertain, mm -hmm. especially with like a lot of the weight and, and turning. And I'm not like the most aggressive rider. And, and to me, it just feels a little, like a little squirrely, yeah. but with the, the rider with, with the wider width, um, it just seems to support the, the tire uh, a bit better. Like it's not as like bulbing out and then coming, coming to the, the contact patch. Mm. Which, which wheels do you have? I thought we had the same set. Uh, I'm testing uh, the Ataras. Oh, okay. So these are the 
650B and the internal width is 28. Oh, 28. Uh, I believe. And yeah, it's. it's I've got just the a... Ipo, Ipo K. Ipo okay. K. Uh, it's 24 millimeter. Okay. Which is crazy that. <laughs> yeah, no, that how much would make a huge difference. <laughs> yeah, it actually. It actually, like, how, you know, just like a, a one degree difference in, you know, head tube angle makes a big difference. Millimeters and in internal width. Um, yeah, it actually, it actually matters. Is uh, the set you have, are they 700 C or 650? They're 700. 700. Okay. Yeah. No. Um, no. They are nice. Yeah. And so, you know, in my, like the way I think about it, you know, there's obviously a spectrum of wheels from like stock OEM up to like, you know, ridiculously overpriced in my opinion. Yeah. But I think, I feel like the industry is kind of settled in on this thousand dollar ish mark for mm -hmm. like, at least as far as I'm concerned, that's sort of optimal. It's a lot of money, right? But, it, right. but for what you're getting, it just seems like the optimal sort of bang for your buck. Um, you start yeah. spending way more than a thousand, then I'm not sure what you're getting. Um, but up until that mark, like every sort of step is a, is a noticeable difference in, in ride feel. Yeah. And the, the logos specifically, like I weighed it. I was like, holy crap. These are literally like the lightest wheels I've ever tested. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't know how they're doing that. <laughs> like I had a, a, a set of uh, Chris King and ND wheels mm -hmm. that costs like maybe four grand mm -hmm. and those were heavier than these so <laughs> <laughs> if, we, if we're going by that metric as like a you know as an attribute that you actually want yeah um the lightness does give me a little pause though um as to like how durable they are mm -hmm. but i've i've been i've not been babying them mm -hmm. and they they seem to have been holding up pretty good so far nice nice um i'll admit i'm still early in that like I haven't, I haven't ridden them yet because they're on the Blackheart, yeah. um, and and Fergus had sent over some, uh, was it the Richie Speedmax cross tires, which I was really excited to try out. Um, they're seven hundred by forty tires, and the clearance on the Blackheart frame is uh, forty millimeter. But when I blew up these tires, they blew up to like forty three millimeters. So. Like I can spin the tire, but like, you know, like the little, like manufacturing, the little fibers or, you know, the, um, like the wear, wear yeah, thing. like the little, like little thingies, the little things that eventually wear off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know what they're called. Those are like in, in perpetual contact with the, I, I, there's like less than a millimeter of clearance. So dang, <laughs> um, I'm not going to write it. Cause I don't want to like some, some people say, just write it. Um, but I don't want to. I don't want to ruin a brand new frame. <laughs> right. So I'm going to wait for some uh, new tires to come in before I actually ride them. But yeah, so I haven't ridden them yet, but I'm excited to do so. Well, it's nice to see a tire, you know, at least in my opinion, like be more than it's stated with, because typically it's a lot less, you know. Right. Right. Um, um, yeah. Th normally, I would say that this is maybe the one time <laughs> in history where I wanted the tire to be actual claimed width or smaller <laughs> yeah yeah um prior so I'm, I'm assuming you've you've had other wheel sets with a similar like internal width right yeah. this isn't yeah it's not like a crazy wide or anything right i think my closest comparison to these wheels would be the uh hunt um uh the uh 35 hunt gravel 35 x wide wheels mm -hmm. um, they're 35 mill millimeters deep i i can't remember the inner width i think it's 25 millimeters yeah so these are pretty close i had a a set of wheels that um i actually bought from uh, garrett over at crust mm. uh they were 26 inch and i was running the renaeurs like 2.3s or something on um on some of my gravel bikes and it was a stains wheel set and the internal width was 30. <laughs> wow. Mountain bike zone. Yeah. And holy smokes, it like it really, you know, you could see like its effect on, on the sidewall with that. Yeah, um, right. It was almost like 
not quite vertical, but like the 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 curve around was was not very pronounced. Um, mm. So that's. But that doesn't goofy. necessarily mean that like wider is better, right? People like no. to go to the extremes, but there's such thing as too wide, right? Yeah, I didn't I didn't mean to get him that wide. It's just what he had, and I was oh. like, sure, I'll try it. <laughs> <laughs> I actually think it was like a hair. I would have preferred like a little bit narrower. Like a twenty eight would probably would have been would have been better. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. Um, yeah, so lots to think about with wheels. Uh, we talked about the hub. Um, where, like, how do you think the spokes affect the ride feel? Like, I can see, I, like, I understand, like, how spokes can affect durability. Mm -hmm. Like, I have a, 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 before we left, I had a less expensive wheel set with, like, straight gauge spokes. And it was the first set of spokes I've broken in years. And it's like, yeah. oh, okay, so, you know. Yeah, I mean, this is, I feel like this is one of those cases when like durability and comfort are somewhat coupled, mm. right? You you put a, you build a wheel with like heavy straight gauge spokes. I, I don't have any data <laughs> to back it up, <laughs> but I do feel like they generally ride stiffer, harsher, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and because there's no flex, there's no butt. There's no butts in the spokes, right? right. So um, <laughs> if it's that rigid, that stiff, it's going to be harsher and the spokes are more prone to, to breaking. Yeah. Um, um, like as far as butting, I feel like that's almost uh, kind of a given on like a nicer wheel. You'll get butted spokes, um, which I don't know. Yeah, I don't know who the audience is here, but, you know, butted just means that like it's thinner in the middle. So they're allowed to flex a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. stretch, expand, and contract a little bit more than if it was the, the same diameter all the way up. Um, so I, I've tried a couple of wheels with like bladed spokes. Are the blades only for, you know, aerodynamics or do they add any in the, the flex department? Uh, as, as far as I understand, they're, they're all for aero benefits. Yeah. Um, it so, Sometimes it makes it, you know, as a side effect, I think it makes it, easier to um you know you can hold the spoke in place without it spinning when you're when you're chewing them up right. um if they're you know asymmetrical that way yeah yeah um i once had a, a pair of uh, rolf primas are you familiar with them mm -mm. based in oregon um and their thing is low spoke count uh very high tension <laughs> oh and those things were harsh. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> like to get the equivalent feel from like a from a different alloy wheel set, <clears throat> oh. I was lowering the tire pressure by like three to five psi because oh, wow. it just it, it just felt really hard. Hmm. Yeah, I suppose if if you've got to tension the spokes that much to get the stiffness that you need, you're you're kind of taking the the compliance that goes with them out with it. Yeah. I would, I would assume. Um, that, oh, when I said asymmetrical, that's that's another thing that that I forgot to mention. When you're buying, you know, wheels, um, I did a video on asymmetrical rims, but it got pretty, pretty sciencey, <laughs> nerdy, pretty quickly. Um, I feel like it's, but it's a, it's an important thing to consider. Um, the asymmetry. So where's where's the asymmetry? It's it's only in the rear rear wheel, or is it no, in both? Front and rear, yeah. Okay. Um, it's, this is one of those things I shouldn't have even brought up. It's hard to explain <laughs> verbally, <laughs> let alone with a diagram. <laughs> um, I mean, the idea is, right, there's, you got the hub that spans the dropouts and the rim has to be centered. Otherwise, that's weird, right? So the rim, those are the two things that are fixed. The, the hub is centered within the dropouts and the rim has to be centered within the dropouts as well. But... On say the rear hub, you've got a cassette that takes up a lot of space, right? So the 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 hub flange has to be moved inboard to accommodate for the cassette. Mm -hmm. Well, then that increases um, the the spoke angle. You know, they they the spokes become more vertical, and the more vertical you get, the the harder it is for um, spokes to support any kind of lateral load. Mm. Um, and the same goes for the, you know, for the back where you've got the cassette on one side, the rotor on one side. So the flanges have to be moved in 
pretty substantially to accommodate um, um, the, you know, the rotor and cassette. On the front, the asymmetry is actually the other way because hmm. there's no cassette, but there is a rotor, right? Uh, okay. So then the idea is the rim is fixed in the middle. You know, it's got to be centered between the dropouts, but the spoke holes don't have to be drilled in the middle of the rim. Right. So the asymmetry has to do with where they drill the spoke holes. And if it's done properly, you can drill the spoke holes in such a way that it's almost like an isosceles triangle. In other words, the spoke, the drive side and the non-drive drive side spokes are almost the same length, um, mm. which is stronger. It's, it's, a, it's a, just a better design. You don't have to tension the drive side spokes so much higher than the non-drive. Um, and so, it's, yeah, I, I went down a rabbit hole on that for a little bit and made a, <laughs> made a pretty nerdy video. But the logos wheels, a, along with a lot of wheels these days, are, are drilled asymmetrically. But, you know, so, so when, you, when you see that as a marketing term, like, oh, these are asymmetric wheels. Right. You know, at first, at first glance, you might think, well, what does that mean? It's like, <laughs> is my wheel going to be off to the side? But right. <laughs> just has to do with where the spoke holes are drilled in relation to the center line of the rim. Right. So does the, how about a front wheel for a rim brake? That's perfectly symmetrical because there's no rotor to account for, right? Right. Yeah. So the strongest front rim pattern would be a symmetrical spoke, uh, smoke, yeah, symmetrical spokes. Right. Um, and going back to the rear wheel, the asymmetry allows the drive side spokes to come in at an angle and less vertical. Is that the yeah, goal there? That's fundamentally okay. it, right. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. I get that as English major. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I you know, I don't rewatch videos that much, but I teach a class called vector statics at on campus. Mm -hmm. So this video is like very relevant to that discussion. So I rewatched it. I was like, oh yeah, I can maybe do an example like this in the class. But you know, you know, when you when you decompose these vectors. All it means is like the amount, like the sort of lateral component of the vector, mm -hmm. um, you want to maximize that. And one way to do that is to is to change the angle of the spoke. Um, so it's interesting. It's interesting, and like it's one of those applications where the the design actually it, it makes a lot of sense. It's you know it's not a new standard like asymmetric rims. It's not a new standard. It just like it's right. a design principle that actually makes a lot of sense for the strength of the wheel. Like what's the, you'd mentioned it allows you to have lower tension on the drive side. Let's say it was a non asymmetrical wheel. Like what, what's the difference? Not like exact numbers, but like a, a ratio of, you know, how tight it is on the non drive side versus the drive. I wish I had those numbers memorized. Um, well, I've, I've, I've certainly felt it on wheels where like the drive feels like stupid tight relative to the, the non-drive side. And yeah. so it's been a little disconcerting. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, the, okay. The spoke tension, you can, you can write it as directly as a function of the angle. Right. So, you know, if, if you, Ooh, I gotta be careful here. It's not, it might not be directly <laughs> proportional mm -hmm. one to one. It could be inversely proportional, but I mean, there's a big di like you can feel the difference. Like on, yeah. if you if you true up a wheel that's drilled, you know, non ace. <laughs> if it's if it's drilled symmetrically, <laughs> non asymmetrically. Um, I, yeah, I always remember like the just the drive side. Yeah, uh, spokes being super tight, and if you kind of look at the profile of a of a rim that's drilled symmetrically, it almost looks like a flat disc of spokes when you look at it from the profile, and you. You really just don't want that. Like you want more of a, a, a they call it a, I think it's called a bracing angle with yeah, you know, okay. builders, but, but you yeah. want more um, balanced brace angles, um, yeah. drive side to non drive side. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All so that, we... all that from the fact that I said the word asymmetrical once. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So that, there's wheels, folks. Uh, pretty important. Uh, lots to know. Now, lots of things to consider. Um, it's more than weight and inner rim width. Yeah, we'll put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Having you know, again, just to summarize my my small experience with wheels, um, 
I love the star ratchet. <laughs> if if not just for this the simple fact like that inevitability when the cassette will pull out the free hub, you don't have to dig around for like six paws in the dirt. <laughs> just yeah. just two springs and <laughs> right. Well, there's two springs and two of those ratchet things, and there's also yeah. a spacer in there. That's I mean, true. there's there's some number of parts, but there's some bits. <laughs> it's easier to put back together than a Paul system for sure. Yeah, uh, it sounds like um, like the DT Swiss. You can change the ratchets or the star right. ratchet, right? To have more or less engagement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you just replace any... that pair of star ratchets with you know one with more or less ratchets. Yeah. What's what are your thoughts on you know high engagement or oh. quick engagement hubs? Is it is it a thing or is it? It's certainly a thing that people think they want um, <laughs> it comes at the cost right because from what i've what i understand like the the quicker the engagement the more wear or it just tends to wear quicker well, i think yeah it wears quicker and i think there's a uh, higher risk of of things binding up or you know mm. things not engaging like the more teeth there are the more chances there are for it to not fully engage which sounds kind of counterintuitive yeah um, i think the people who really claim they need high engagement is like um, mountain bikers, right? When you're climbing up some crazy technical rocky thing. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I tend to think that it's not one-sided because if you've got like, you know, if you've got um, super high engagement, but then you're actuating the suspension, the, the pedal kickback is just amplified, which mm. also could negatively affect your, your pedaling up that technical thing. And I've, right. you know, I mean, as long as it's not like, you know, like half a pedal rotation before it engages, <laughs> everything these days is pretty reasonable. As long yeah. as you're, say, under, I don't know, six to eight, six to 10 degrees, maybe is perfectly fine, I would say, for most, most applications. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I would rather, like, I feel like I'm, I would prior, rather prioritize reliability and just have like a, regular engagement <laughs> for crazy high thing that's prone to fail <laughs> it's definitely one of those things where you know if you're the of the maxim maximizer mindset and like more is always better uh you could maybe uh misguide yourself into thinking that it's it's better at for all all purposes but mm -hmm. um yeah there's 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 definitely a compromise yeah yeah um one, one other thing is that this dt swiss hub design um like you can i'm pretty sure you can take bits from a dt swiss hub and swap them onto these logos wheels i think it's like that compatible yeah. um, and what i understand is you know this i, I think it's called the the hoogie the hoogie <laughs> i'm probably <laughs> mispronouncing it but the hoogie style hub hoogie i don't know this star ratchet design was like patented for a long time by dt swiss yeah, you know, I think other companies wanted to use this technology, but they had to, right. as far as I understand, they had to change the design just enough to get, a, you know, past the patent stuff. But uh, I think that patent expired recently. So ah, um, yeah. I think, you know, Logos was keen on that. Maybe that's one of the reasons they went in on this style um, because now it's sort of openly available. It's an open standard for other companies to use. Yeah, because I feel like... Um... If I'm not mistaken, like Thesis, the the bike brand, which you know then gave birth to to, to Logos, were selling wheel sets that had DT Swiss hubs. So it was already you know within their um, you know within their their family for for a bike build. So it makes sense if mm -hmm. they're to to branch off into wheels that you know they'd look at you know maintaining that maintaining that same hub design. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. Cool. Well, should we should we switch to the, the two other things? <laughs> Holy smokes, we had two other things to. Yeah. <laughs> Sheesh. Well, what were they? Yeah. Well, well, wheels are are they're just that important. There's so much to consider. Um, <laughs> on a lighter note, how about this thing? Um, what the heck is this thing? <laughs> oh, this is something that keeps popping up in my feed, and I don't know. I thought like I kind of brushed it off at first, but then I looked at it. I was like, "Holy crap!" I think. It just like solved my biggest bike problem. 
um it's it's a thing it's got a it's like a laser gauge like it just mm -hmm. projects a straight line that's normal to the the handlebars that's perpendicular to the handlebars it's so okay. simple and the more i looked into it there's other companies have something similar with like you know some have just like a laser pointer that points down <laughs> which doesn't help as much as you would think i right. feel like this is maybe the first time i've seen this and it kind of blew my mind um it's universal right you can clamp it like the the section of handlebar on on either side of the stem mm -hmm. on any bike that i could think of is symmetric so i see regardless of the shape it's the same on both sides so if you clamp something to that and then you project a line <laughs> right that's perpendicular to that you know how simple but uh, i feel like this is the first time i've i've seen that is there is there any way to like screw it up in the mounting of the thing though like if it were like slightly offset yeah um, yeah I guess you just have to, there's probably some kind of register mark where you try to align it to the eyeball it to the middle of the stem. Um, I don't know. Like, I feel like even if it's biased to one side, right. you're still getting the line on That's the tire true. that it should be parallel to. Yeah. Um, so unless you have some like crud on like the inside, which doesn't allow it to sit flush on the handlebar, I feel like it's pretty idiot proof. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. It seems you can't even get them yet. Um, <laughs> you can pre-order them. Yeah. Um, maybe if you reach out or something, they'll send you some. There you go. <laughs> yeah, this um, popped up on a. I was watching or perusing the YouTubes, and I, I remember someone showcasing this and looked kind of interesting. Oh yeah. For the. It just seems so obvious, but. I haven't right. seen anything else like it. I yeah. made a whole video nerding out about like how to mathematically get straighter handlebars, <laughs> which interestingly that video did pretty well, but like this is so much simpler. This totally um, negates that video. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Next video is to, to do a DIY hack with a laser level. <laughs> yeah, something. right. Yeah. Right. Um, so that was it. That was an interesting, interesting one that popped up. I don't know. Yeah, what the, I, this is not really over under. This is just like interesting thing that popped up. Yeah, another interesting tool that the. the let me see if I can find it here. Um, do you know the brand uh, Runwell? Mm -hmm. They make. Yeah, um, they're based in Japan, and they make tools. It came out with this really, uh, again, stupid, simple one, but I thought was kind of interesting. Let me bring it back here. Oops. It's, uh, it's a thing to measure uh, chain line. Oh. Because that's that's another thing that's a little bit tricky to to measure. Uh-huh. Um, so and if you can see it, it's a stew hickey that just rests on uh, the down tube. Uh huh. There's like a, a slot um, or a little concave uh, cutout. I mean, it assumes a couple things. It assumes that you're riding a bike with like a, I think a 28.6 down tube and that you're trying to achieve a 42 uh, millimeter chain line. So it's not as. Um, you know, it's it's kind of like measuring just just one uh, one chain line. But how do you know that it's perpendicular, or how do you know that it's parallel with the line with the axle spindle with the crank spindle? Um, I think maybe that's where the this cutout comes into place. Like it'll just register in there. Maybe. But, but, <laughs> but what I'm or, picturing is that like on a round tube. That cutout is kind of like smushed up against there. Sorry, but can't it like rotate about the down the the seat tube? Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, it could, yeah, and it could be <coughs> that make a huge difference. Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, it's interesting nonetheless. I, I yeah. it's hard to tell from the picture, but maybe that seat tube is not round. Mm. Like maybe it actually slots onto the seat tube perpendicular. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. No, that looks pretty round. Yeah, I know. That's a good question. Like, how do you... Maybe it looks like it's got a like a register mark in the middle that well even if that was in the middle it could rotate and throw the measurement off hmm. um, yeah I'm not sure uh, but I thought that was a interesting interesting tool to to measure like a tricky that tricky cool. measurement it would be cool to have a develop a tool that can measure rear chain line mm. now that one's always you gotta do some you gotta do some serious calculations to get your rear chain line. <laughs> or lasers. <laughs> <laughs> if the person that made the the stay straight thing uh, would get into the chain line game, right? I feel I feel like that would be a actually kind of an interesting application for 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 lasers and stuff. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Plus lasers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next thing. Uh, Kushkor for gravel <laughs> for the grab grab. Gravel um, core, okay. Yeah, I mean, like if you look at that bar, there's like a a Kush core meter at the bottom there. Mm, I mm -hmm. guess on the very right is downhill, and then on the very left, oh, you you scrolled past it. Uh, right? Oh, here, right yeah. over the price. Yeah, on the very right. left is like gravel CF. <laughs> and I honestly, I didn't really put two and two together. Like Kush core for mountain bikes, you know, a lot of people swear by it. Um, yeah. And I suppose Kush, Kush core for gravel makes sense, but it just seems like I watched a video of, of Ron um, try the whole video was just him trying to install Kush core. Right. And there was a lot of tension in that video because it was very <laughs> challenging. <laughs> um, I, I feel, okay. Yeah. I don't know. What's your take on it on inserts in general? Um, you know, I haven't tried them personally specifically for that reason. <laughs> <laughs> like every installation video I've watched has just made me then like, no, <laughs> yeah. um, I did, you know, we did do a, a bike packing event where I don't know if he owned, he, if he invented Kushkor or if he works for the company, but he was there. And on one of the days, um, a lot of climbing, really gross weather, his bike was completely flat, but he rode the last 10 miles in, uh, mm. completely flat and just on the Kushkor. Oh, um, so that was, it was cool to see that, um, yeah. you know, if you don't have the time or it's the, the conditions just suck and you don't want to deal with, you know, repairing a flat that this could at least help you limp home, right. um, adequately. I do think it's interesting in terms of protecting the rim because I have a, maybe a bad habit of, of running my tire pressure a little bit on the, <laughs> the low side. <laughs> Uh, and especially when you're talking about the carbon rim, right? Yeah. Um, alloy rim, I, you know, I'm, I'm less skittish about dinging with, because of the low tire pressure. But with the carbon rim, I feel like I, you know, I'd, I'd want to be more cautious. Right. But then at the same time, you put it in there, it negates like the all the, the weight savings, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're not weightless, right? Um, and, and I feel like they change the... Like you spend all this money getting a like a super light supple sidewall, and then mm -hmm. you bolster this giant piece of foam up against it. I mean, maybe it doesn't have as big of a, an effect on the ride feel as as I'm imagining. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Like uh, on this ride that we this mountain bike race, I took the Richie, um, which was a, a dumb move. That's a whole other discussion. But <laughs> we were so, so severely underbiked on the gravel bikes. <laughs> And there were, you know, rocky descents, which, you know, I, they would have sketched me out even on my mountain bike. And so on a few instances, I did, I heard just like rim <laughs> smack into rock. Um, and I was expecting, I don't know, I don't know what I was expecting the tire to, you know, lose air. Um, yeah. yeah, I cut the sidewall in the process or dented the rim and <clears throat> everything was okay, fortunately. Um, and I think maybe that's what got me started thinking about Kush core for gravel. Um, but I think, yeah, maybe if you're, I suppose if you're heavier and you ride a lot of rocky terrain with like edges that can easily, you know, yeah. ding the rim, I suppose maybe then it's, it's worth it. You know, I could, I totally consider it if you're doing, um, you know, some backcountry riding, uh, really remote, um, you know, bike packing, just, just in terms of, uh, you know, preventing things from 
you know, like dam <laughs> damaging a rim, um, yep. you know, the ability to, to run able lower tire pressure or, or flat so they can limp home. Um, <clears throat> but I think for I, that, that'd be for a very specific purpose um, to go through what looks like the, the pain of installation. <laughs> I'm just kind of browsing the comments like everybody has had seems like the same experience <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah like I, I, I just don't understand why it has to be so well that probably don't question why it has to be so hard like is it not possible like it doesn't the Chris core insert isn't holding any air or there's no pressure like why does it have to come in a in circular form like could it be a long strip that you wrap around the tire then fasten yeah, something like a, like how you'd use a, a what's it called tire chains <laughs> or for like some kind of a turn buckle. So yeah, right, right. Bring it bring it together. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like it doesn't the fact that it's under tension is only keeping it in contact with the rim. But I feel like you can develop some kind of some fastener that would do that. So you don't have to. Yeah. Or <laughs> yeah, if it had. If it came in the strip, had a turn buckle, and you had like a little extra piece to bring to, to take up the gap. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, but I guess you'd have to reinforce the ends pretty good so it just doesn't tear through the foam. That yeah. might be the, you know, an issue there. And maybe I'm I might be mi missing the point, but maybe the challenge isn't getting the the liner on the rim; it's getting the tire over the liner. Probably it's true. Probably, yeah, probably what it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh look uh, ashley says uh, victoria has an insert that is a strip and you fasten oh interesting oh damn it there you go <laughs> there you go no excuses check that out <laughs> anytime you've thought of something it's already been done <laughs> yeah okay yeah all right well i have to look into that thanks thanks for letting us know yeah, yeah. uh sam says uh some tire insert companies use a zip tie to fasten but it does leave a gap. Yeah. Um, well, I think we're our hour is up. But if you guys have any last minute questions, let us know. And uh, otherwise, we'll just take it home here. If you have any questions about wheels, um, so how's the how's your Blackheart build going? Is it is rideable yet? <laughs> it's um. I ju actually just finished it last night. Um, yeah. Oh, I wonder if you can, can kind of see it here in the background. It yeah. looks so nice. It's like, like <laughs> it's the first bike. Like it's just frame is all one color, and then everything else is black. No more tan wall on this bike. Um, <clears throat> I waxed the chain. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, based on our last conversation, so I waxed the chain yesterday. Uh, but I haven't ridden it because I'm like I don't want to rub off the the Cerakote, So yeah, <laughs> um, maybe, or maybe that'd be a good test. <laughs> what wax did you use? Yeah, so I I use the Silka the 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 bag, yeah, um, with their new chain stripper. Um, what do you think of the the chain stripping process? I mean, really straightforward. Like I put it in a little one of those disposable Tupperwares, just put yeah. it in, you know a little bit on top, and then agitate it around, and then rinsed it with water. Right, the whole the, the thing it's all biodegradable. At least that's what they yeah. claim. So it'll just go down the drain. Um, I didn't need a crock pot. They just put the chain <laughs> in the bag. The bag goes in a pot of water. Yeah. Didn't even have to do dishes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that, that, that chain stripper that they came out with, I think for me is a game changer because it the biggest hurdle of, of chain waxing isn't the waxing part. It's the, the stripping of the, the factory yeah. grease part. Yeah. The prep, and yeah. to just have it using one, one thing, mm -hmm. uh, one bath, Rather than you know the old way that I would do it would be using you know some mix of simple green and until it gets relatively clean and going into a denatured alcohol bath and then you know drying it out and to to strip the factory grease for me took about like twenty minutes but with mm -hmm. the the silco chain stripper it was I think it's maybe 10, 10 minutes or so yeah it's quick and it seems like it did a good job oh. yeah. One thing I probably screwed it up is um, I was just going off like the instructions on Silka's video, but you know when I I pulled the bag out of the the water, 
and kind of left the chain in there until like just that point when it started to almost re solidify and then I pulled it out. But there's just so much wax on the chain. And I feel like you know, most <laughs> of it should have dripped off, but a lot of it stayed just because I waited so long to, to take it out. Right. And now like it's on the bike. Like, I mean, maybe like after an actual ride around the neighborhood, it'll kind of all flake, flake off. off. But, yeah. But even right now, like just pedaling, it feels so stiff. And so I'm worried that I did something wrong or <laughs> maybe it's just like that until you ride it. Yeah, they'll break off. Uh, usually like a oh, fresh, freshly waxed chain, I'll find like a broom handle and just kind of run it through uh, the links and have it like go around the, um, a curve and that'll break off most of the, the mm -hmm. stiff parts. Yeah. So. Yeah. So we'll see about that. Um, yeah. The old, like before that chain stripper, um, I think people were using gas. Is that? Yeah. Right? Petro yeah. Petroleum. <laughs> Some people use straight up gasoline, Yeah, like, which is, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's fine if you can do that. If you have like a garage, but if you're like in an apartment and don't have much storage or don't want to store that stuff inside, then, you know, I right. totally get the chain stripper. No, you know, yeah. That, so it's that. definitely not the cheapest way, but I kind of wanted to like, it's kind of sad. Like everything I do now is like, there's a video motivation behind it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so a lot of the videos on chain waxing now are like, it takes you through the whole process. Um, it's a, it's a long process. You need a crock pot or like an instant yeah. pot. It's a 30 minute video on the whole process. <laughs> I just wanted to see something where it's like, this is the, the low, the, lowest common denominator the minimum required effort to wax the chain. <laughs> right so get the stripper wash it off put it in a pot right and, and see how that goes <laughs> yeah yeah um let's see someone asks uh, david do you have to clean your cassette and chain rings too with the stripper um if you have a used chain ring and cassette i'd probably just wash it off with like degreaser and water or some kind of bike wash but you you're doing on the fresh install right so there's no great gunk on any of your components no this is this is not a this is these are used parts oh they're used parts okay yeah so did you did you i assume you just washed them really well <laughs> yeah so the, i was worried about the chain i was doing a lot of searching on can you wax like an old gross chain because um, everything is all about stripping the factory grease off a brand new chain or the factory yeah. lube. And you can. <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I, I cleaned the chain as well as I could. And it actually took two baths in the stripper. Right, The first... <laughs> that sounds really weird. The first stripper bath. <laughs> um, it, like, it was just like gross. Like immediately, it was just all the grease came off. So I, I rinsed that and then did a second bath and it was a little bit clear so that was just to take off the residual stuff uh, but you can wax an old older kind of gunked up chain yeah just it, it just takes more effort and time yeah right yeah uh any specific brand of stripper that i can use uh th so far there's only one <laughs> actually <laughs> <clears throat> and it's a silka one uh it's spendy but you get a lot of chains out of it yeah you know, and it's, you know, it's less hazardous than I think. Um, some people always want me to fight, fight me on this than using like kerosene or, or gasoline or, or flammable things. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And like the stuff that they use, you know, it's, it's biodegradable, not at that concentrate, but it's, you know, it, it diluted enough. You know, it should, at least theoretically should be okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know that the Silka stripper is not flammable. Do you, do you know that for sure? Uh, that's a good question. I, I'd, I'd assume there was like some super citrus based thing. Oh, oh, oh I got you. I yeah, that's not, probably right. And not like a, a petroleum byproduct of some mm -hmm. sort. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not a chemical engineer. I don't know too much. About I mean, you got the bottle. You got a lighter. <laughs> Silka chain stripper. Can you use it for a Molotov cocktail? We'll see. <laughs> uh, yeah. 
And I don't know if that's a serious question, but the <laughs> the strip the the stripper is actually very thin. It's like um, you know, it's, it, it almost just uh, it, it kind of resembles like like a isopropyl alcohol or something, but it's not. It's different. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Sandra asks, are you saying wax change is only for one time new factory chain to grease? Uh, no, we're saying that it's easiest to strip factory grease off of a new chain and wax it. You can do it with a older chain, but it just takes more effort. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what? Why is my face so red? It's because I have such amaz amazing lighting. <laughs> um, okay. Well, I think with that, uh, we'll take it home. Sounds you good? good. Yeah. All right. Uh, all right. Well, thanks, everyone, for joining us on the podcast. Uh, apologies for my audio and my lights. Um, I'm in my childhood bedroom in my parents' house, living the dream as a YouTuber. <laughs> um yeah thanks again nolan and uh we'll do this again and as always everybody keep the supple side down <laughs>